Content warnings for this episode include transphobia and ableism. Genderful would like to acknowledge the indigenous peoples and unceded lands that the producers, hosts, and guests live and have dwelt upon. Today, we honor the Coast Salish, Mississauga Nation, Woods Cree, and Assiniboine. We honor the elders, the human, plant, and animal ancestors of these lands and celebrate the living descendants of these peoples. May all beings tend these lands for the goodness of the next seven generations and beyond. Welcome to Gender Meowster Podcast Network. Genderful is a talk show featuring non-binary and trans folks discussing various topics and special interests. We kindly remind our listeners that no person is a monolith of identities. All opinions are the speaker's own. This show airs live on Twitch at twitch.tv forward slash gender meowster and VODs with show notes can also be found on YouTube. Meowdy everyone, I'm Gender Meowster. I use they, them pronouns. Welcome to Genderful. I'm going to let my wonderful guest introduce herself. Hello, I am Sai Clark, uh, she, her. Um, interests, I don't know. Uh, I write science fiction. That's my interest. How many of the books and behind you are yours? Is, um, government is falling apart. That's an interest of mine. I'm obsessed with that. Uh, it's imploding at the moment. We currently have a PM regent. Um, that's fun. Uh, the books behind me, yes, they are mine, except for the handful that are actually my partners, but most of them are mine. Wow, that's a lot of books. How many have you but written? I haven't counted see all of them. <coughs> I haven't counted them. Um, and the vast majority of them are ones I have quite acquired in the 12 years that I've lived in the UK. Um, there's a few that I brought with me from Canada, but mostly they are ones I have acquired since then. That is wonderful. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, well, welcome here. It's a delight to have you on the show. Um, there's, a couple que- there's a couple questions that we typically like to ask our guests, but before we get to that, um, something came up in the pre-show we were talking about, and I thought it might be interesting to... Um, talk about it. So you, we, we were emailing back and forth about land acknowledgements because that's a new segment that we've added. Um, we should have added it two years ago, but here we are. Um, and you were saying that in the UK, it's sort of seen or experienced very differently than maybe in, uh, North America and Turtle Island. So I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so that's really interesting because that was one of the questions I got from you and your team ahead of this was, you know, what lands, whose lands do you occupy? And um, that's kind of in the UK, that question would be a racist dog whistle because it's a way to use um, to sort of imply to black and brown people that they can never truly be British, regardless of their citizenship, regardless of the fact that they may have been born here or raised here, uh, regardless of how many generations of their family have lived here. um, You get people going, yes, but you know, you're not really from here. You Mm -hmm. can't, you know, you'll never be British. And so, you know, when you live on conquered lands, it's very different than living on the conqueror's lands Mm -hmm. um yeah the uk is very differently racist than um but i mean i've never i've never lived in the us but i you know see a lot of it on television um but it's very different one of our greatest exports is our media (laughs) yes uh uk as well um but yeah it's very differently racist than canada um and it is definitely racist it is definitely xenophobic but differently so than um, colonized lands. Yeah. I appreciate you explaining that to us as a team and also giving us b- benefit of the doubt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't. When I that didn't, question I, came to you. <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't think you were saying, so are you brown? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, we may need to add something about how this team is from North America. And so all the questions <laughs> are from the, the frame. Yeah, of, you know. col- the colonized lands yeah so i live i live in the colonized lands and so for for me and for 
you know, perhaps the indigenous uh, tribes and bands that live on Turtle Island, a land acknowledgement is a meaningful nod towards mm. like yeah. a bunch of a bunch of white people and other people came along and stole your sacred land and made up ownership, which wasn't a concept that yep. exists before we arrived. Um, yep. So, anyways, it's 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 interesting to talk about how how it is different in different places. So, thank you for bringing that that piece in today. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, being in the UK, it's actually it's weird because um, they don't understand here. It's so many people don't understand why um, First Nations costumes, ideas, names, words they have no concept that that could be racist. So even people who would make a concerted effort to not be racist in in ways that they think of. Right. We'll just have, you know, I've been sitting at, you know, outdoor cafes and somebody walks by in full regalia stereotype of a First Nations um, costume banging a drum for some charity. And I'm just like, holy crap, you are being so racist right now. But <laughs> yeah, I don't know that. And it weirdly is rude to just tell uh, someone who's fundraising for charity that they are a walking racist stereotype mm -hmm. um yeah so you're not supposed to do that really. yeah for just as a as a loving reminder for our audience um yes it is october it is a scary season halloween and Samhain are coming up um but people's uh racial and cultural identities are not costumes you get to wear <laughs> so please yeah. don't do uh, that try to be more creative than just I stole someone's identity yeah cultural preparation yeah. is not a costume that's right okay so that aside Sai um I would love to ask you about gender stuff and then we'll launch it to gender and sci-fi how does that sound absolutely all right I don't know anything about gender so good luck with your questioning <laughs> um so so what are things that you can trace back to your youth that indicated you might be gender diverse of some flavor one day? Do you know, I don't even know because I think I was just weird, full stop. Uh -huh. I mean, I grew up in a very conservative, small C and large C, um, conservative evangelical background. Um, but in a way, I was always exempt. And this is, I don't know, it was like, if you're the weird one, then you kind of, it's expected that, oh, well, no, I'm, I'm terrible at explaining this. Um, like, okay, for example, this school that I went to, so very religious, right-wing, conservative, small, private school. Um, and um, between the ages of 12 and 14, girls had to take home ec and boys had to take industrial arts mm -hmm. and so girls had to learn how to cook and to sew and to balance a budget and boys had to learn how to use tools and I don't know things like that um I'm proud to say that I personally contributed significantly to the fact that we went through 10 home ec teachers in a single school year um, <laughs> because I strenuously objected to this practice and this division and it kind of was some, I don't know, is, is it the fact that I was tall and ugly? Is it the fact that I was weird personally? Is it the fact that I had a weird family? But it was always just kind of assumed that I was never going to be the, the wife and mother homemaker. All the other girls in the classroom, absolutely, because that's what women do, but not me. And so I was kind of always exempted from that. Um, um, also, I was getting regular lectures from my parents, well, from mainly from my dad, that um, I should never, I should never accept a lower salary than a man, that I should never um, accept a lower job than a man, that I should take my career and pursue it as my dad's big lecture to me was, you know, whatever you want to do in your life, you pursue your education to the farthest extent you can possibly take it. You pursue your career to the farthest extent you can possibly take it. If you want to have a car, you buy a car. If you want to have a house, you buy a house. If you want to have pets, you get your own pets. If you want to do anything, you do it yourself. 
And then when you've done all that, then if you decide you want to get married, then you can get married. It turns out cishet men aren't interested in someone who has done all those things. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, I just, somehow I was always exempt from those rules that women are this and men are this. And I was always exempt. Um, so within your, your dad basically this, told you overcome the patriarchy, but I also he didn't do. Up. I didn't think it was real. Yeah, but he also didn't like do anything to systemically change the patriarchy at the same time. <laughs> I don't just know telling what he you was to do doing. better than all the other women that are constrained by the patriarchy. I mean, you know, it worked because I did. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I was always exempt, and so now I don't know if it's because of that or in spite of that or what. But you know, people ask me, "What's your gender?" And I'm like, you know, I, I, like I get those forms. You know, what is your gender? Mm. And I'm like, can I just exempt myself from this? Because my gender is exempt. I'm just exempt. Just no. Just no. My uh, gender you know, oh, is the, just no. Just no. <laughs> no. No. Um, yeah, just uh, exempt. I, I can get a note from my parents if you want. Just no, I'm exempt from gender. They probably so, wouldn't write a note, but but yeah, they might. I don't know. Would you say that today you identify as agender? Gender exempt is the word that I use. I okay. don't know. Is a, I mean, it's probably a gender, but I don't know. I, you know, I still, I use she, her pronouns probably because of habit um, and clarity. I don't know, but um, yeah, I don't like. What if your pronouns were no and no's? <laughs> <laughs> Just no, no. <laughs> I mean, I think people would probably go along with that. Anyone who knows me. Um, yeah. Yeah. I we have folks know. in the I'm, chat saying, yeah. as a mom friend, I will sign folks' exemption notes from gender. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> we need an adult. Good thing Sunbury is here. <laughs> gender marker. No, thanks. <laughs> the, closed caption, the closed captions said that we could have an exemption note from Denver. And I've never been to Denver, but um, I could have an exemption note from that as well. I've been to Denver. Some of them would write the note. Some of them maybe wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have another another uh, question from the chat. Can I have an exemption from contemporary masculinity with an affirmation of maleness note? <laughs> I don't know where you'd get that note. My dad's not going to write that one for you. I don't know. <laughs> um, so, Sai, how has your relationship to gender evolved over time? So you had, you as a kid, you were sort of exempt. You still sort of identify with that now. But are there, are there ways that maybe after you turned 18 or what have you, that your gender presentation maybe changed or evolved? Or have you... I don't know. Has has anything changed from childhood to now? Have you sort of evolved or grown in in regards to gender? I think growing up, I had this idea that gender was a thing that I had to, right? Like mm. it was like in it, it, I was exempt from all the stereotypes and the rigmarole around gender, but that I had to be gender. Um and then and then I went through a phase. So I had, um, I was really, about a decade ago, I was really, really sick. I nearly died. Um, I had severe sepsis. Um, I had emergency surgery. Um, and then in the aftermath of that, and I know that other people who've had sepsis have said that there is there is like a PTSD period that you go through after sepsis. And for me, that post-sepsis PTSD played out in a performance of gender way where mm -hmm. for about a year after that, I performed gender in a more stereotypical way than I ever had in my life until one day I was just like, oh, okay, I'm bored of this. And it just all gradually fell away. But um, I still had this idea in my head that Although I didn't want to be a woman, that, that 
that wasn't it wasn't an option not to be it was just something I was uncomfortable with but I had to be uncomfortable with it um and then kind of alongside that um there was this idea that um sorry my train of thought is like going all over the place and I'm trying to follow it but it's um it's hard to catch um there was this idea that um people who are trans I thought I can't understand why someone would be trans. I can't understand that. And the reason I thought that is because for me, if I were to describe the list of things that make me me, that the, the, all the ways in which I am who I am, gender would fall off the bottom of that list. And I think mm -hmm. most people, if they were introducing themselves and talking about who they are, gender would feature pretty high on that and but for me gender was like off the bottom of the scale and it didn't occur to me that that wasn't the case for everyone it didn't occur to me that mm. most people cis or trans or somewhere in between most people gay or straight or bi or whatever have an innate sense of their own gender mm -hmm. and it wasn't until i went wait, they, they, uh, people have an innate sense of gender? Mm -hmm. Learning that made me realize that maybe, maybe I'm the odd one out because I don't have that. Gender is not, is not part of who I am. I mean, I am female and I'm okay with that word. I have, I have, you know, it, I have, the, uh, uh, it's an adjective, not a noun, mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I'm okay with that adjective used to describe me, but no W words. No, no, I won't be having with your W words. I, um, five years ago, I got married and my partner after that one time <laughs> used the, the W word. And I went, no, I'm not comfortable with that word. I don't like it. No, please never use that word again. Um, mm, I just, it didn't, I don't think it really occurred to me that I'm the weird one that, yeah, gender is just, no, gender um, is just no. Would you, would you say that you have a neurodivergent brain? Because in oh, my yeah. experience, oh yeah, yeah, in my experience, oftentimes people who are neurodivergent experience gender in a very different way from neurotypicals and so the sort of like my gender is shrug mer, is very it, it, especially in my friends with autism which i also have autism it's like a big it's a big shrug to gender it's like i don't uh. Pass. <laughs> yeah yeah so so you know it's interesting to talk about the intersections right of like of how that party list is different and you know maybe it having to do with neurotype because that also neurotype will impact our perception of ourselves mm -hmm. our perception of others how we how we think socializing ought to be or not realizing that not everyone is xyz way or what have you mm. so let's let's pivot and talk a little bit about sci-fi and gender so um yeah, so science fiction tends to assume that extraterrestrial species will all or almost all have the same two genders that most humans are used to. What's what's that about? What's your opinion on that? What is that? What is yeah. that? Where does that come from? I mean, even when we see in science fiction, when we see a species that has some sort of gender difference, it's always like, Oh, there's men and there's women, and there's a gender that's in between. It's like, why wouldn't different species from a whole different planet, why wouldn't they have a completely different concept of sex or gender? Why, why do we assume that whole other planets full of people that have nothing to do with Earth, why do we assume that they would have this male-female binary, that they would have, you know anything approaching like what we have why why is that and i don't understand um and so yeah that's what i 
created in my series is just um, a whole universe full of people who have very different ideas about what sex and gender mean. Um, one of the main species in my series um, comes from a, well, they're, sorry, one of the, the, the secondary characters in my species in series. One of the main central characters in my series comes from a species that has six sexes and no concept of gender. And so literally the only time that someone's physical sex characteristics are in any way relevant or important is when you're talking about either reproduction or medical health to do with, with sexual matters. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, my main character who's human asks her, what does sexual orientation even look like in a species with six sexes? And the response is orientation. How does a compass help you figure out if you're attracted to someone? I love that. I am, I am curious, does this species with six uh, different sets of sex characteristics um, ever have sex for recreation or pleasure? Or are they mostly only using it for Constantly. recreation? For, yeah. <laughs> well, they, um, well, at least at least the, the character who is in my book, yeah, she's... Um, so the main character is arrow ace a gender human um and forms kind of like a, a qpr with this other character bexley but bexley is um you know in every book she's like oh i'm gonna go find someone to have sex with now bye um uh yeah that's fun i like that that's a that's a good mix of of things yeah i love the arrow ace representation um hmm. Yeah. So my next question is, why are humans so bizarrely obsessed with gender? Honestly, I wish I have no idea. What is it? Why? Why? You know, when we look at other societies, um, like other human societies that have historically had castes, we think, oh, that is so antiquated and historical. And we look down on them for, for that. And yet we have to casts that everyone is expected to put themselves into someone on twitter last week was banging on about how men wear trousers and women wear skirts and that's just basic biology wait what how is that biology what what why why does biology say that women wear skirts what does that mean and so i you know my reply to that was and non-binary people wear culottes i'm sorry i don't make the rules that's just how it is um what what because I don't understand. What is that? It doesn't make any sense to me. A lot of things don't make sense to me. I'm probably not very clever. Or you're just neurodivergent and you're trying to make <laughs> sense out of neurotypicals. It's fair. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I bet, I bet um, neurodivergent spaces make more sense to you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> um, so I'm curious what sci-fi books and authors do you know of that have more interesting or expansive takes on gender? Obviously there's you, but <laughs> can you, can you think of anyone else who've done an interesting job with gender in the sci-fi genre? Do you know what? It's, it's really weird. I mean, I've read a lot of science fiction where there are um, non-binary human characters um, or where there is an alien race that is all one sex, right? Like there's, um, you know, the Orville, I really like the Orville, um, and they have um, uh, one species in the Orville that they're all only men. Um, that's not very creative, but at least it's something different. Um, yeah, there just there seems to be a lot of non-binary representation in science fiction, um, and by that I mean sort of this, like, I don't know, not male but not female, but not anything else either. Um, and then you get like genderless aliens where they're all or genderless or all one gender um, or there's male and there's female 
And then there's this gender in the middle that's kind of partway between. Um, but there isn't a lot of, or at least I've not found a lot of science fiction that has other ideas about gender and sex. I mean, I don't read um, just because it's not my thing. I don't read a lot of like, like erotic and <laughs> probably would I wouldn't enjoy um, erotic science fiction about you know other kinds of genders so maybe maybe it is out there and it's all just erotic and I've not found it because it's not my thing in that way <laughs> I don't know um, yeah those I feel like those are more likely to have expansive sexualities maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe expansive sexy. genders but definitely more likely to have expansive sexualities yeah um, have you do you ever watch Star Trek things oh yeah yeah. All right. Have you seen Have you seen the episode of Star Trek? I think it might be in the Next Generation, where there's the the planet of genderless aliens, but one of them sort of identifies as female. As female. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen that episode? What is your What yeah. are your thoughts on that episode? I mean, at the time, right? I'm old. Okay, I'm old. At the time, it was very clear that this was this is a metaphor. She is gay. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's a start, but I, I feel like it, it's, yeah, I mean, it is good, right? And I, I think I've rewatched that one recently. Um, it's kind of, you know what, it's very, very similar to the, um, Cheery Little Bottom in, uh, Pratchett, um, mm -hmm. the dwarf who is female and, you know, Pratchett, uh, the turfs love to claim Pratchett as their own, but he was not, and his daughter will tell you he was not. Um, mm -hmm. a cheery little bottom um, was a dwarf, and dwarfs all use he pronouns, um, and they are all male, regardless of whether or not they are male or not. Um, you know, consenting adults may know what's in a dwarf's pants, but no one else needs to know. Um, uh, but Cheery Littlebottom was like, no, I'm a woman. Um, and that, you know, the, the classic line of, well, it's, it's egg more pork. We have more, more than one gender here. Because um, we're modern. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know what the question was anymore. I forgot. It's okay. We were talking about the Star <laughs> Trek episode with the, yeah. the genderless species. Um, it could you know, have gone further. It, it could have. There is something that kind of happens there that, so spoiler warning for a TV show that came out in the 90s, but um, <laughs> but there is a part where essentially this person goes through conversion camp to yeah. get to get her to, to go back to being genderless. And so it's like, I feel like the ending of that episode is really problematic because it's like the people yeah. that those people's like won that fight. It's like, Oh God. Yeah. That's so but terrible. that's, I mean, it's problematic in the same way that another spoiler alert, but for a book that was published in the 1940s um, in the same way that the ending of 1984 was problematic, right? Because it's more impactful as a, as a message to have it end on a sad thing, right? If yeah. it had a happy ending, it wouldn't have been as impactful. So even though it's it's problematic in the sense that um, that's not the ending we wanted for that character, and even though that's not the ending we want to see, it makes it, it makes it deeper, right? If they'd have just, you know, if the end of that episode had gone, oh, yes, okay, you are female, we will accept, it, it would have been. Yeah. It would have been a happy ending for the character, but it wouldn't, right. the episode wouldn't have had the same meaning. Why do you think it is that um, stories need to have bittersweet or, or sort of dramatic endies, endings to have that punch? Like why, why aren't happy endings as impactful just in general? I don't know that it's, I don't, you know what? I think actually what it is, is, we are so accustomed to the idea of a happy ending 
a happy ending is the norm in fiction. It's what we're trained to expect. It's what we usually get. And that's why it's impactful when we don't get that is because it's a surprise, right? We expect a happy ending. So if we always got a sad ending, then it would be the happy ending that, that was impactful. Mm-hmm. It's, it's purely, okay, I have a post-grad degree in finance, including post-grad uh, economics. And one of the things we learn in economics is what drives value? Scarcity. So mm. that impact comes from scarcity. I think that applies equally to fiction as it, as it does to um, global financial markets. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think that humankind as a species will ever get over our gender hangups? I'm not sure we're going to make it to Christmas. So no. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> I'm not an optimist. I mean, that's, it's fair, <laughs> but for a moment, if we suspend our disbelief in making it that long in general, with all the terrible decisions we're making with, you know, World War Three and um, global warming and, uh, you know, a pandemic that's totally kicking everyone's butts and people aren't paying attention. Um, in a world where we somehow manage to make it through all of that, <laughs> what does a post-gender world look like? This is a this is a topic we, we had like on episode three of this show, like gender abolition. What does that look like? I wonder if, if you, Sai, as a sci-fi writer, have ever written about or thought about like gender abolition and what it looks like to just not have gender be a consideration socially anymore. So I have, um, I have uh, d- 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 my other series, which was my first science fiction series, uh, which is um, a near future um independent hard hard science fiction so much research went into that um uh about a the first permanent independent colony on mars Mm -hmm. um and um this is a massive spoiler for that book uh for the first book in that series but um the the punchline of of it is that they decide to take almost exclusively women with them when they go to Mars. So they're taking 160 people um, and they decide that 150 of those 160 are going to be women because the whole purpose of this uh, colony is um, is basically um, a a backup plan for the human race, right? So if Mm. earth goes very, very wrong, then at least there will be a colony on Mars that the human race can continue and the things from earth can continue. Um, And so, um, building this colony, they decided that, that, you know, people who can bear children are the ones you need most of in that 160. And so it it ends up being, uh, there, there is a trans man in the group, um, but um, it's mostly women. There's And there's also a few cis, cis men as well, uh, but it is the vast majority of that colony ends up being women. Um, and Any trans women? Not openly. <laughs> oh well. That, 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 doesn't, that doesn't come up in the uh, in the in the first novel. Um, and then, um, in the uh, in the second novel, what you start to see is um, as the generations well, not generations, as one generation, as the kids begin to be born because they're born into this society that is almost exclusively women. So the, the first generation of kids is, is um, mixed between male and female children, assigned male at birth, female at birth. But, um, uh, but because they grow up in a society that's almost exclusively women, their pers- the kids' perception of gender is very very different from from ours and and that's how I think that kind of moving past gender is it that's how I think that would have to happen is is some kind of shock to the the culture like that and um I've, I've only written the first two books in that series because it's so much work um yeah. uh, and it ends kind of um 10 years into the the colony's life um and one of the things that becomes apparent in that colony is that 
the kids are used to the pronoun she um, and the way language evolves. And I've been kind of thinking about the next book in the series. And I don't actually know what it, the story would be about. But over time, the pronoun she comes to mean um, like people who are close to us. And the pronoun he, uh, because of reasons within the story, the pronoun he comes to mean people who are not one of us. And so I want to have this conversation between a um, one of the second generation and this trans man who is, you know, he, he spent his life on earth fighting for the right to be called a man, fighting for the right to be called he. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he gets to Mars and all the kids want to call him she. Um, and he he takes that as an insult that they don't see him as a man. Um, and I kind of want to play with that idea that the kid, the kids keep wanting to call him she, and he keeps correcting them. He, but that's because the meanings of the words he and she don't have the same right. connotations, right. different generational to, contexts. Yeah. Um, and I want to kind of explore that idea with him and how he comes to how, how he deals with that. Yeah. But that's that's the way I think that if humanity is ever going to get past gender, it's going to be some kind of shock, culture shock like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's it's so interesting to think about what that could look like. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes. Let's see. So can you tell us a bit about what your writing process is like? So you mentioned you had to do a lot of research for this series you were just talking about. Um, yeah. what, what is, what does that process look like? How long does it take? And I know, you know, each book is different. So one may take significantly more or less time than another, but just for, for those listening who maybe it would be interested in doing similar, similar writing projects themselves. Um, maybe what is, I'll combine my questions. What is that process like? And what tips can you share for how writers can respectfully world build different systems of gender in sci-fi? Um, so what does the process look like? Um, so first thing is, if you want to write hard science fiction, that is science fiction that has a focus on real world science, expect to go down deep into rabbit holes on research. I had to do so much research for that series. Mm-hmm. Uh, way more research, way more time went into researching the science behind that story than actually went into writing the stories. Um, So there's that. So um, that's why my next series is soft science fiction. And whenever a concept comes along that is, um, you know, how do we have warp drive? Instead of explaining the science behind it, because there isn't any, we just go, "Eh, Clark's third law. Um, so what does the process look like Clark's for me? Law. That's your last name, lol. It, I mean, it's my <laughs> last name, but it's, it's not my law. Um, it's <laughs> Clark's, Clark's third law is, is Arthur C. Clarke. It is um, any sufficiently advanced technology looks like magic to societies that aren't as developed. Um, so I rely heavily on that in my latest series. Um, uh, what does the writing process look like? I just spend a lot of time thinking about characters and stories, um, and plots and what happens and how does this work? Like literally I, I will spend just ideas sort of ferment in my brain for, for maybe a year before I set down to, um, to create a plot based on one of them. Um, and then what I do is I try to plot out the, the points in the story and I, I plot arc things out. And then I create a chapter map where I have like, I know how, excuse me, how many chapters there are. And I give myself like two bullet points per chapter of things that need to happen in the chapter. And then I start writing. And if I try to write without that, then I just end up going nowhere. Yeah. Um, and as for um, 
writing diverse societies, I think, um, take yourself outside yourself, right? Like, um, I have a character, I have a character who's a robot. And uh, really early on, I wrote into the series that, um, that she was on wheels. And then I had to stop and think about accessibility and how are worlds accessible to someone who uses wheels mm -hmm. to get around. Mm -hmm. And then I started thinking about the message that this portrays to, to people on earth who use wheels as as their mobility um, aids. Uh, and, and I tried to make sure that I was weaving that in in a respectful way, right? Because I, I don't have um, mobility disabilities. So I, I've i never had to stop and think about, you know, oh, that curb is too high to get a wheelchair up. Um, and so I started looking at how to, to include people that way. Um, and then I had a species um, that um, communicated through sign language, not because they were deaf, but because they didn't have um, articulate, um, their mouths were not built for, for articulating so many sounds to, to speak that way. And so they spoke with sign language. And then I had to think about how we as speaking and hearing people interact with um, people who might be deaf and yeah, just step outside yourself and think about ways that you can, um, I guess, look at, I don't want to write a story that isn't mine, right? I don't want to be culturally appropriative. I don't want to be disability appropriative or, or anything like that but I do want to include, so I wouldn't have a main character who is, you know, deaf and in a wheelchair because I wouldn't, that's not my story to tell. Um, but I want to include those characters around my main character. And that's, I think, the, the, the key. There is a fine line between being culturally appropriative and being inclusive. And that's what I want is I strive for inclusivity, not appropriation. And sensitivity readers are your friends. Yes. And you should pay them. And you, yes. They're not your friends. <laughs> they are your business relationships, but yeah, they are. Yeah. Well, if they're your friends, you should pay them even more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're your friends, but they're, yeah, they're, yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, okay. So is what other sci-fi has inspired you in your, in your writing as a kid or now, um, have there been like, how did you decide to become a sci-fi writer? What, what happened or what series uh, of events happened that sort um, of brought that up? I was, I was unemployed and, and I didn't want to sit on the sofa and just like dissolve into a lump. Um, uh, yeah. So I, I have, yeah, I worked for a long, long time, um, you know, very, very demanding day job. And then, um, and then I got made redundant. This was in um, the end of 2017. And then I had a lot of stuff going on in my life that kept me busy until the start of the next year. And then at the beginning of January, 2018, I still hadn't found a new job. And I was like, I can't just sit on the sofa every day. I can't, I can't. And so I got up when I walked over to my computer and I started writing. Um, and I'm not at a stage where <laughs> it can replace my day job because eventually I found one. Um, I make about three pounds a day from my writing. So that, that's not, that doesn't pay the mortgage. Um, but, um, uh, but it keeps me happy. So, um, yeah. Um, all right. So I have about three concluding questions. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything that we missed about gender and science fiction that you'd like to make sure you say? So is there a question that I didn't ask that you wish I had, that you would like to answer or a soapbox oh, you want to get on about this? One just as soon as we hang up, but okay. I don't. <laughs> 
my brain. That's fair. That's fair. It's, it is late where you are. And, you know, we wanted to keep the show to about an hour. So um, can you share an experience with gender euphoria? No. Or maybe or maybe <laughs> a gender euphoria. Like we'll flip it on its head. Is there a time or or a, a, a moment in your routine where you feel like there is no gender at all? And therefore you're like blissful because you don't have to think about it. Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> I don't, I, yeah, I don't have anything. No, I just, I don't know. I know for me, sometimes if I get, if I get like really invested in a project I'm working on, for example, like if the hyper-focus snaps on, all of that stuff can kind of fade away unless whatever I'm hyper-focused on is related to gender, which does happen since I'm sort of a gender activist as it were. But, um, yeah, I'm just, I was just curious. We asked that, we ask every guest that question. So it's okay if you don't have an answer. Do you know what? I, I have, um, there was a scene in one of my novels that every time someone asks me about gender, I point them back to this scene because I used my characters to speak my voice here. Um, where, um, no, I've already used this one. The, um, the, how does a compass help you figure out if you're attracted to someone um that's yeah a conversation about gender i know i don't understand what is this you you keep using that word and it just gets blanked out by my translator because what no i love yeah. that um i'm curious if you've ever heard of autogender which has to do with autism being part of your gender <laughs> um, yeah i have um yeah, I think it's definitely part of my identity of who I am. Is it part of my gender? I don't think so because I don't understand what gender is, but yeah. Um, I write a lot about gender for someone who has no idea what gender is. I mean, plenty of plenty of men write about women's experiences and they have no idea what being a woman <laughs> is like, so. <laughs> Resting boobily. <laughs> Um, that's so funny. Anyway, so here's my, here's my last question for you. What would you like to make sure folks know about your perspective on gender and, or non-binary or trans or a gender or gender not found issues? I gender not found. Yes. I like that. (laughs) Um, that's good. Um, you don't get to gatekeep. You don't get to gatekeep anybody else, anybody else's experience of gender, um, that's just not cool. I got into an argument one day on, on Twitter with someone who took objection to me saying that if you don't adhere to the gender binary, you don't have to call yourself trans. And this person got really angry and said that I was demeaning trans people. I said, I'm, I'm definitely not. Um, and they said, oh, you think it's an insult to be called trans? I said, no, I don't. Um, I don't do gender. And then then they said, well, if you don't do gender, then you are trans. And I said, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not exactly cis, but I'm not exactly trans. And this, this is the thing. Don't gatekeep. Don't, it's not yours to tell anyone else how to do gender. Um, and that's, I think, what I want the world to understand is that you should do you the best way you know how to do you, mm-hmm. but you don't get to tell anybody else how to be true to themselves. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. You got it in one. <laughs> <laughs> I win. You win. You win the episode. Huzzah. Um, all right. Well, everyone, uh, Cy Clark is a Canadian misanthrope who lives in Deptford, Sarf, East London. I probably totally botched the name of that place. <laughs> um, as someone who's neurodivergent, an immigrant, and a proud owner of an invisible disability, she strives to present a realistically diverse array of characters in her stories. You can check out her website, whiteheartfiction.co.uk. The link is in the show description. Um and you're also on Twitter as Claxi and on Instagram as Claxi underscore author. And those links will also be in the description below. Um, yeah. Is there, is there anything else you want to make sure you promote or mention um, here at the end of the show? Uh, so my next book coming out next month, 
has um, uh, totally not an allegory at all. Um, is a uh, space tale about unicorn rights. The villain is a former children's entertainer who gives up her career in order to pursue a hate-filled agenda against a diver uh, an oppressed minority group. So um, yeah, is that. Um, it's called Consider Pegasus, and it is the third book in the Starship Teapot universe. The first book, The Left Hand of Dog, is free for a few more weeks. Um, yeah, there you go. The Left Hand of Dog, check it out, it's free. That's so wonderful. I love it. Um, I'll, I'll make sure to collect a link from you for that to put in yeah, the show notes as well. Um, but I imagine they can find out more on your website. They absolutely can. That's wonderful. Um, Whiteheartfiction.co.uk. Thank you so much, uh, Sai, for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. So everyone, next week's guest is um, Spencer, and we're going to be discussing the Little Petal Alliance, which puts together these wonderful um, gender euphoria gift boxes <laughs> and does a bunch of other things, too, that we'll learn about next week. Um, so in the meantime, Genderful would like to thank our guests for being on this podcast. Please feel free to join us live on Twitch on Mondays, check out the replays on YouTube on Fridays, and keep an eye on your favorite podcasting platforms for edited audio only versions. As Never Kitty likes to say, trans rights are human rights. That's right. <laughs>